but NATO has its meetings, you know, all over the place, and uh, we're part of a, a group, an alliance called No to NATO, um, that has been protesting NATO in every summit that it has had in different places, in, including uh, this year where it was in Madrid. Um, but until recently, American people didn't know what NATO was. And um, we were not able to get the corporate media t to help to educate people about what is NATO. Um, it's been hard to... Um, uh, the best that we've been able to do is make alliances with the Europeans to support them in their efforts to uh, say no to NATO's insistence that they spend more of their money on the military. You know, what kind of alliance comes together and says, our goal is to spend more money on the military. <laughs> we have a goal of spending 2% of your gross domestic product, and we're going to make sure, you know, at every, that everybody in this alliance gets to that level or beyond that level. You know, let's see who can spend more money on the military. And that's exactly what NATO is. So to call it a defensive alliance is just ridiculous. It's always been an offensive. I mean, once the Soviet Union fell, it's been an offensive alliances that have done all kinds of illegal things from the bombing of Kosovo to the invasion of Afghanistan to um, the invasion of Libya. And so in Europe, there have been movements that have been uh, quite effective of saying, uh, no, thank you, um, the US and NATO. We do not want to spend more of our money on the military because you know what? We have a national health care system and we want to keep it. Or, you know what, we allow our students to go to college and, and uh, uh, not uh, come out as indentured servants. And uh, so we don't want to spend more of our money on NATO. And uh, so there has been a, a fight to hold the line. Uh, and um, very few countries were meeting that goal, which is why Donald Trump from the time he was saying NATO is obsolete, and we said, yes, yes, until he started saying, no, the problem with NATO is that the rest of you uh, countries in Europe are not paying enough. You're not paying your fair share. And you really put the screws on, uh, but it still wasn't quite working. And it was only now with Ukraine that those countries are all saying, okay, we're spending more money, we're spending more money. And the Germans um, came out very quickly and said, we're gonna spend $100 billion more on weapons. And, you know, this is such a boon to the weapons industry and particularly to the US weapons industry that it is also a boon to NATO. And now we have the phenomena of uh, Finland and uh, Sweden wanting to join NATO and whoever thought we'd see the day when Sweden had this right-wing government and wanted to join NATO, uh, and Finland that was doing just fine without being part of NATO, suddenly wanting to become part of NATO as well. Uh, and so we hook up with the groups in those countries that are protesting that. Um, and uh, um, we have regular uh, online now, but also we've had in-person gatherings about NATO. Um, but you're right, we haven't done our job in um, getting people to understand that NATO uh, should be obsolete, that it is an aggressive military alliance, and that it has been so provocative when it came to uh, Ukraine. And, you know, the people who think differently from us, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they say the whole issue of NATO in Ukraine is a red herring that NATO was never going to allow Ukraine to be part of NATO uh, for several reasons, including the fact that you have to have territorial integrity in, to be able to join NATO, um, because Article 5 says we're going to have to jump in and help you if you have um, a, a conflict, a, a military conflict, and, um, NATO, and, and Ukraine doesn't have its territorial integrity. It also has still issues of tremendous corruption. It has in issues of, um, uh, of economic uh, privatization that the uh, NATO, even though it's not an economic uh, gather uh, institution, wants to see happen. Um, so uh, the, uh, when, they, when uh, Zelensky just did this fast track 
Um, some of us thought, uh-oh, you know, this is really dangerous, um, but it's symbolic because the NATO countries are not going to allow Ukraine in right now. But you can't say it's a red herring because Zelensky himself said just last week when he signed that fast-track application, he said, we are de facto a NATO member. We now want to be de jure a NATO member. And de facto, yes, the Ukraine has been part of NATO. I mean, what do you call it when you have an alliance where um, the NATO countries are training 10,000 uh, Ukrainian troops a year, where they're pouring into wep in weapons in every single year. Um, in 2015, the U.S. started allowing offensive weapons to be able to, s to be sold into NATO and when uh, into Ukraine, and Ukraine is part of the military exercises that um, NATO is doing. So it basically is a part of NATO. So, um, you know, NATO has unfortunately been strengthened by uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, uh, but I don't think this is going to last for very long because I think we're going to see a lot of uh, protest happening in European countries over the price of energy, uh, over uh, the issues of inflation of the economy in general, and people are not going to be in the mood to keep spending more money on weapons and not going to be in the mood to keep, sp uh, to keep uh, putting these uh, sanctions on Russia that have only harmed uh, the people in Western Europe and in other parts of the world. So that's a long answer to say we need a lot more education around NATO. That's a great idea. That's a wonderful idea. And I think actually if we put it out to some of our donors, we'd get somebody who would want to donate to that. Um, I, I, I love that idea. Thank you. Yes. Is there a mic for the audience, or can you repeat what they're saying? Absolutely. I think we have to do more writing and more educating on the connections between the climate and what's happening in Ukraine. And on so many levels, there are connections to make. I mean, the war itself being horrific for the environment, the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipelines and what that is doing in the release of methane. Uh, the issues of uh, the increased production now of oil, gas, and use of coal, and the non-decommissioning of, of nuclear power plants. Um, but then there's also, as you said, the, the money that's being spent. And uh, we were, uh, my colleague and I who wrote the book together, were looking at, um, listening to all the speeches at the United Nations and hearing the speeches of some of these uh, small island nations that are at risk of disappearing because of the climate, saying, you are putting more money into this war in Ukraine than you have put for the last decade into the global climate fund that you promised you were going to put $100 billion into. 
And you know, what does this say about your concern for our islands and for the planet? Um, so yes, I think you're totally right that those are areas to talk to people about that can really get to them more. Wait, 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 the Zoom would want to hear the question. Oh, okay. Um, so this is regarding, um, regarding Putin. Um, besides um, Putin being motivated by um, the aggression represented by inviting all these countries into NATO, do you perceive any, any other motives in Putin's action invading um, Ukraine? Well, I don't know. You can read some of Putin's speeches, and he certainly seems to long for the days when Russia was a more powerful country that uh, had uh, a, a broader um, reach. You could call it an imperial desire of, of Putin. Um, you can also see that uh, he thinks that um, Russia was losing its strength vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. hegemony and the U.S. position uh, in the in in um, uh, with the Europeans, um, I think that he uh, also was misinformed, terribly misinformed, uh, about what was going to happen when they entered Ukraine. And I think he did believe that this was going to be a special military operation that was going to be over very quickly and be successful. Um, but um, uh, you know, it's hard to get into. Uh, Putin's brain and understand um, not only what he was thinking when he launched the invasion, but what is he thinking now. But I think an important thing for us to recognize is that when uh, uh, authoritarian leaders, well, when any leaders uh, start getting backed into a corner, um, which could be what's happening now, uh, that they uh, will not give in, that they will find other ways to lash out. And the um, the, the key for Putin lashing out is a nuclear weapon. And, you know, we've had people in our government who say, oh, he's just bluffing, he's not going to use it. And um, that is just so incredibly dangerous to think like that because they're the ones that say Putin is irrational. <laughs> so why would you think that he is incapable of using a nuclear weapon? I think, uh, yes, and then Brian. Uh, Medea, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the, I'd like to ask you to address the coup in 2014 and uh, the, how NATO and the U.S. had a play in it, if it's true, and then also about the paramilitary groups that went there. And are they the instigators that are uh, firing against Donetsk, the, the people in Donetsk, and uh, they uh, making it look like it was the Russians? So in terms of the coup, um, you know, there was an uprising that I think was a genuine uprising against a corrupt, unpopular leader uh, that was then seized upon by both uh, the right as well as the US and the West to say, aha, this is a moment uh, to get out a leader who was pro-Russian and to put somebody in who was pro-Western. And so I think that movement got co-opted and it did turn violent and there were elements of um, you know, Nazi groups who were part of that violent um, turn of events. And uh, there was also uh, the US involvement that we know from Victoria Newland, who is based there, uh, who uh, was caught on tape talking to the U.S. ambassador about how uh, who was going to be put into power once uh, the pro-Western leader was overthrown, and I mean the pro-Russian leader was overthrown, and uh, that tape uh, is evidence enough about how the U.S. had its hands all over this, as well as her going out into the square giving out donuts to people in the crowd. Um, and I think that in years to come, when we can get these Freedom of Information Act 
documents, we're going to see a lot more about the hand of the United States in this, just like the U.S. has been so involved in other coups around the world. And, you know, it is quite ironic that the American public thinks that Russia interfered in our elections to get Trump to win, and yet uh, most Americans probably do not want to admit the very, very strong role that the United States had in making sure uh, that the coup happened, um, that Yanukovych was overthrown, and also making sure that the deal that his government was trying to make um, to not have it uh, be a coup, but a democratic transition, because they were talking about uh, having a new round of elections, um, and how that was squashed as well. So the uh, book goes into great detail, a step by step, uh, as to what happened during that uprising, what was the role of the uh, neo-Nazis in this, and people also say, well, you know, the neo-Nazis are such a tiny percentage. Um, they only got 2% of the vote in the elections but that doesn't show how strong they are within the military. And yes, it was the Asof Brigade that incorporated a lot of those neo-Nazis um, that were the main fighters in Mariupol. Uh, actually, some of the, the uh, early uh, prisoner swaps were for people from that battalion. Uh, but we do go into quite a lot of detail in our book about the role of the extreme right. And as I said earlier, I think one of the uh, most pernicious roles of the extreme right was the threatening of Zelensky when he wanted to make the peace and forcing him to go along with them in choosing uh, to not negotiate with the Russians. They put in the killing, right? Yeah. So, I, Brian, you had wanted to say something. Victor? Oh, oh and Victor. Yeah. And then Brian? I, uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I had one quick question and one longer observation. The quick question is whether you have any observations about the explosion in the Baltic and the uh, sabotage. Uh, but the, the longer observation is I'm struck when you talk about the position of the Republicans with parallels to the debate over COVID. Because uh, from the beginning of the uh, whole COVID epidemic, uh, there was an attempt uh, on the official part to suppress efforts at alternative treatment uh, and so just say, go home unless you can't breathe and then, uh, and, until we get the vaccines. Um, and oddly enough, since the Democrats were not sympathetic to this kind of uh, break with the far big pharma, which is a big source for them, uh, they, they left it such that the doctors uh, had only, the only platform they could find was with, with the Republicans. And so you had this perverse situation, just like you have Republicans opposing uh, the, the big armaments to Ukraine, you had Republicans opposing the imposition of censorship against doctors. So I, I just wanted to make that observation and see what you thought about it. Thank you. Well, as far as the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, I find it quite incredible uh, that so much of the mainstream media refuses to talk about in whose interest uh, is it to see that sabotage happen. And it's certainly not in Russia's interest. I mean, Russia had no reason to blow up its own pipelines. Um, it, it can and did just turn off the switch uh, of the gas that was going through those pipelines. And then does the U.S. have a motive? Of course they do. Do the U.S. energy companies have a motive? Of course they do. Uh, and uh, did we even hear Biden himself? I remember that press conference when he was with um, Olaf Schultz from Germany, and he said, if the Russians invade, they w there will be no Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And I thought, wow, that is so wild that he's saying that with the German when guy. Huh? When was it he said that? He said this before the invasion, right before yeah. the invasion, yeah. And, uh, and I thought, gosh, how could he say that? I mean, how, how could he say that the U.S. would make sure that there was no Nord Stream 2 pipeline? Well, lo and behold, I think the U.S. made sure that there's no Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So I'm pretty convinced. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm pretty convinced. Brian, you say no? No, I'm pretty convinced. 
Oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and in terms of the other question, I mean, I think it's, it's another example of how both parties pretty much are in the pockets of um, the big corporations, whether it's big pharma, big oil, big weapons companies, and that whoever's the one in power uh, has an even closer relationship uh, with those companies, and it allows for a little more uh, leeway of those who are out of power uh, to be advocating for um, more uh, uh, possible alternatives. Um, so yes, I, I think there's a, a, an, a, an analogy to be made. I have a uh, quick question. Could you explain Hunter Biden's role in this? I mean, it was, how did he get yeah. there and what happened to him? I mean, he disappeared from the news. I and another, another quick question is that civil war in uh, Ukraine lasted seven years. Was there any negotiations for peace within that seven years? Yeah. So Hunter Biden, I have no idea. I don't even know what happened to Hunter Biden. I mean, it's really a, an incredible mystery. But if the Republicans get in, we will have the Hunter Biden saga uh, right on our front pages all over again. Um, the, uh, the issue of the Civil War, um, that is where the Minsk agreements came from. First, the, the first one and then the Minsk two. Uh, that was negotiated in 2015. And it actually was working quite well because the majority of the casualties happened in the very beginning of that civil war. And um, then uh, the uh, organization, the OEOSCE, um, the European Security uh, Organization, came in with a large number of monitors, 1,300 of them, to monitor this situation, and they did a pretty amazing job. And they kept uh, the, um, uh, the statistics very clearly on uh, the decrease in the amount of fighting that was going on until very, very close to the time of the Russian invasion when it went up tremendously, and it was mainly coming from shelling from the Ukraine side into Donbass. Um, but the, uh, the, oh, the, the, the monitoring of the Minsk Accord, uh, I think, could be seen as quite successful. What wasn't successful is the political part of that Minsk Accord, because it was supposed to lead to autonomy for the region. And it was supposed to be that uh, the leaders in Ukraine were going to meet with uh, the leaders of the breakaway republics, and then there were going to be elections and there was going to be uh, autonomy. Um, that part of it never happened. And then we go back to the right wing, and there, uh, every time a leader, including then Zelensky when he came in, tried to uh, make uh, good on the political side of the Minsk Accords, um, they found opposition among the Ukrainian right. And the U.S. did not do anything to to implement those accords either. Um, but it is an example of you can reach an agreement and you can get outside monitors in. And were the political part successful, I think we might not be seeing this war right now. Probably wouldn't. I just want to ask, um, where do you see China in all of this? Uh, before the war in U Ukraine, we were, talk we were hearing a lot about the Quad. We were even hearing about. You might want to explain the quad. Yeah, yeah, the Quad, a new alliance of uh, the United States, Australia, Japan, and India. And we were also hearing about NATO even doing activity in the Pacific, which is absurd given what NATO stands for. Um, but now with the war in Ukraine, it seems that the, the eye of the United States and its allies has been taken off of the Pacific somewhat and focused back uh, on, on Eastern Europe. Um, so what do you think China's opinion uh, of all of this is and what's their role uh, uh, diplomatically? Well, China is really um, benefiting from this. And uh, they have tried to not take a position, uh, but they have been the main beneficiaries of the sanctions against Russia. 
uh, they are getting oil at a tremendous discount, like a 30% discount. And um, that's because the Russians don't have a lot of options about where to sell their oil. And the uh, Chinese don't want to uh, get involved in the middle of this. There are many people who said in the beginning that China should be the mediator, that China had the ability to talk to both sides. Uh, and the Chinese, I think, felt that they were smart enough to stay away from that. And uh, so they have uh, refused to go along with the economic sanctions, but they don't want to directly stand up to the US and the West either. And um, in terms of the US taking its eye off of, of China, um, the US military has not done that. They continue to see China as the number one adversary. Uh, we mentioned Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan and what a horrific move that is, but yeah, part of that whole thing of yeah. uh, it continuing to, to be provocative against China. But the U.S. gets itself into these positions where it can't do what it wants, which is go after China because it's stuck. You know, it was Obama that wanted to do the pivot to Asia and he got stuck in the Middle East. And now it's Biden that wants to do the, the pivot to Asia and he's stuck in his uh, proxy war with Russia. So um, in that sense, uh, I think China benefits in many different ways from this. Uh, we see the United States now squandering so much more of its money on the military and on Ukraine. Uh, the Chinese are spending a lot more money on their military as well, but it's a fraction of what the United States is spending. And uh, they uh, continue to take their very um, smart policy towards the entire world, which is uh, we want economic ties. This is about the Belt and Road Initiative. This is about trying to have win-win situations where we create these um, big infrastructure projects that might be terrible for the environment, but they tend to uh, be things that leaders in other countries want to see happen. And they're out there making a lot of friends around the world um, while the United States is pouring its energy and money into an un unwinnable war in Ukraine. And uh, Michael Hoey from the Zoom will be mad if I don't ask on his behalf uh, what the role of the National Endowment for Democracy uh, might have been in, in, I assume he's asking about the Ukraine coup. Well, Andre the National mentioned. Endowment for Democracy has been years supporting groups inside Ukraine. Um, it has always supported these color revolutions. Uh, it has uh, always supported, quote, democracy building efforts, which is just so ironic because, you know, if there were other countries that were um, funding groups to overthrow the U.S. government in the U.S., uh, we would definitely say that was illegal and that was not part of democracy building. But the U.S. was doing this in Ukraine, just as the U.S. is doing this with the National Endowment for Democracy in so many other countries, uh, interfering not only supporting think tanks and media organizations and all kinds of organizing, but precisely groups that want to overthrow the government. And um, so, uh, NED's hands are very dirty when it comes to interference in the internal affairs of Ukraine. Whoops. So I'm from Brazil, and a lot of my friends in Brazil from the left are saying, um, get NATO out, but they are not saying Russia out because they still think that Russia still represents the Soviet Union and has the right to defend itself and Ukraine is an enemy. So they say to me, you know, you say Russia out, NATO out because you live in the belly of the beast because you are all surrounded by liberals and progressives and you forgot that what it means that um, that Ukraine has been used by the United States and so they are provoking. Putin really didn't want to start this and look at him. He didn't have any other option. And then they also say to me, and since Cuba is so precious to you, 
So look at Cuba now, and look what they are saying. They are not saying, you know, Russia out. Are they at least out loud enough? So I was asking people from Cuba, what are their points of view about the war in Ukraine? And some of them were vocal saying that Russia out as well. So what is your take about Cuba and this war in Ukraine? Yeah, I think that um, some countries and individuals get caught up in a big contradiction when they talk about this war because they want to talk about sovereignty and the rights to not be uh, interfered with by outside forces, in which sense you would say the U.S. shouldn't be imposing a blockade on Cuba, uh, Russia shouldn't be invading Ukraine. We should re respect the territorial integrity of other countries. Um, and I know a lot of Cubans who are against the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, maybe on the official level, they find it harder to say, but even when pressed, there are officials in the uh, Cuban government who say uh, that they don't think this was the right move. Um, the, uh, in terms of Brazil, it was really fascinating to listen to Bolsonaro's speech at the UN. Bolsonaro was very good <laughs> when it came to Ukraine. Uh, here you have this right-wing leader, uh, and you'd think um, uh, that he would be siding with the United States, because he does in so many other ways, and yet he came out saying that um, this war is a disaster, uh, that the, this uh, grain shortage is, is hurting our people, um, that we can't get the fertilizers in Brazil that we need, and um, that there has to be negotiations to end this war. So you're laughing, but you know, it's interesting for me to hear somebody like Bolsonaro taking that stand. Uh, in terms um, of people who defend Russia's actions, um, I think we can say that as people who hate war, uh, we can't defend any action that has brought so much destruction and continues to you know, rain so much destruction on the people of Ukraine, and uh, that I think Russia did have options uh, and um, didn't use all of those options. Uh, I, I think that, um, uh, that he was terribly provoked, and we understand the provocations. Um, we talked about the expansion of NATO. We talked about the 2014 coup, um, but there were provocations on a regular basis in terms of the U.S. putting in its uh, missiles and moving its bases closer to the border and um, uh, the, um, the um, I think as any peace-loving people that we just have to say um, we're against war and we're against invading other countries. So I know it's not, you know, we don't all agree on this, and there are certainly people who support the, uh, the Russians and think that they're only uh, defending their own country and defending the Russian speakers inside of Donetsk. And, uh, and I do think that um, it is important that people understand more how uh, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers have been discriminated against in Ukraine in terms of their language, speaking their language in school, um, being able to have uh, a free press in the Russian language. Um, but uh, I, I uh, also think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of Russian speakers and ethnic Russians who are against this invasion uh, and don't want to support the Russians who invaded and don't see themselves as being liberated. <laughs> I think well, we have an amazing opportunity at our fingertips because whenever there's war, then there's, there's an opportunity to reverse it. And there's three main elements. One of them is that uh, the, before they invaded, the whole world was saying no war. So they don't want it. So they are against war, the people. And so we need a people movement. The, the second thing is that uh, Secretary General Guterres issued a call for a global ceasefire. 
in itself, it's not going to solve all the problems, but it's the lead in to the next step. And then the third thing is that there's a power out there that's ready to go right now. And it started with, uh, with the people in Israel. They came together, Arab and Jew. It was the women. Then you, Medea, were with the people that went over to the DM, across the DMZ. The women said, no more war. Then the, the people the, here in the United States had the Women's March on Washington, which went global. And why were the women doing this? There's a sociologist, George Lakoff, that said it's because they care. And so there's a possibility now around the world to reverse this war and reverse what's been happening by saying logic, the logic is going to dictate here. We don't want the war, and the women can make it happen. Right here on my button on code pink, it says women for peace. It's the answer. Well, I love your um, spirit, and, and I think we'll take one more um, comment over there, and then thank you so much. See, the women care. <laughs> thank you. Um, Harvard is the only university that is uh, continuing to offer a chair for Ukraine, and um, in that, as part of that program they have speakers, and they have for you know decades, I don't know, maybe two decades by now. And I've gone to some of the talks. Um, one of them was targeting the arena of the oil need for more cheaper transportation from Russia out. And therefore, they would never give up territory because they have two deep water ports. That's the nutshell part. However, when you're talking about the United States, uh, 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 to me, uh, not logical at all, um, stopping what they have already in terms of transportation, the pipeline, um, then there's more pressure to keep and enlarge the dominion within the Ukraine of Russia, um, it, following that logic. Um, and follow the money is really a simpler way of saying it. Um, well, um, you, um, on sideways, we're talking about some of the overlap of the domains, like Farm, farm Co. And how um, I'm very concerned about that because it's go growing ballistically with something that people don't talk about because it's not in the press, because it can't be, because it's the mafia. And there's mafia in many different countries at, at work in all of our cities. Owns many, many, many apartments, hundreds and hundreds in both sides of the river even. And they're the ones setting the rules about this, these enormous hikes to the students. Uh, and the real estate people are not in any position at this point to be fighting them um, in, in terms of logic. Um, the, so the, the link between the two is um, when you have an arena that's mega powerful and growing at an astronomical rate, that's Farmco. They're killing um, uh, alternative, inexpensive ways to be healed and to, and like, like CAM, complementary and medical uh, and in medicine um, practice. And some of those are things like, um, well, the children that are babies born prematurely and they're tiny and they're in, the, in those little um, boxes they're so tiny. And they are helped with their weight doubling if they have a nurse that knows Reiki energetics. No it's not a rational explanation, but that's a smaller piece of what they're doing to something that has tremendous, tremendous. I was sitting in the Senate uh, with five feet of proof of how acupuncture does not give you the reactions and helps, especially for addiction, very inexpensively. You can have four and five, like at the Fenway Center, of addiction that's alleviated. They, they're not forced to be by the biology and stuff with that acupuncture. But So I think, I think we get where you're going, which is to say there are all these alternatives out there that are... Uh, whether it's for energy alternatives or whether it's for medical alternatives um, that are much more healthy for us and for the planet, but we're not being able to, we're not able to take advantage of them because of the powerful corporations. And in that same vein, uh, we see who is benefiting from this war in Ukraine. 
and that is the energy companies, and it is the weapons companies. And I think the American people don't have any clue about how powerful those companies are and how much they play a role in um, de determining our policies. I just told you how hard it is to get into Congress, how we have to claw our way to just get into the door. And when we get there, we're just so heartbroken because you see all these guys in suits and they're just walking straight in, not to the side buildings where the office is, but to the Capitol, the big main building. And that's where you have the real meetings. That's where the real deal making goes on. It's just right off of where they do the voting. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a big um, racket, uh, the way our system is set up, and it certainly doesn't serve us in times like this. And so I want to end going back to, you know, your hope that this is a moment when we could build, because as we get deeper and deeper into this mess, more and more people are realizing that our government is not meeting our needs, and that this endless stream of weapons into Ukraine could indeed lead to a nuclear holocaust. And when the COP27 meets in Egypt in November, if the Chinese and the Russians and the US aren't talking to each other, what kind of global agreements are we going to be able to meet? And so you know, I think there's a convergence of forces right now that could either go the catastrophic direction or could go in the direction of real movement building. And our job is to make it go in the direction of the movement building. So I want to end by thanking you all for coming tonight, uh, for thanking Dean for giving us this beautiful space. I'm sorry the video didn't work, but we will send out a link to you if you've signed up on the uh, MAPA list. Uh, and then to just thank those of you who are active here um, for keeping this area one of the more progressive areas of this country that are giving us a glimpse of uh, the way that we could remake our nation so that we spend our money on the planet and people's real needs, not on war. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Medea. And before you go, I want you to look at the poster that's behind that, that non-functional flat screen TV. There's a list of our Sacco and Vanzetti Award winners, 2018 Medea Benjamin. Yeah, and that means a lot to us. Um, uh, I also want to draw your attention to our newsletter that just came out. There's a bunch of them over there on the uh, table. It has uh, a list of upcoming events. This Sunday, we start our season, Leonard Peltier Day, uh, Peltier Day. Uh, Carol Goki used to be the, uh, the director of the International Leonard Peltier Defense Committee. We have John Pilger joining us from Australia. The next week, we have um, our former minister, Reverend Jason Lydon. There's a, a beautiful drawing of him uh, leading a demonstration over there, um, talking about prisons. He's a real... Uh, 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 leader in that field of prison abolition. We have our new staff person, Amar Ahmad, giving a talk uh, about God, John F. Kennedy, and Russia. Uh, and I won't go through the whole thing. I also want to draw your attention to the, uh, the hall and the walls of this hall. They've been just so beautifully graced by the paintings of Diane Esmond, the mother of our good friend, Victor Wallace, who is here tonight. Uh, we're having three days of celebration of this beautiful gallery exposition on October 14, 15, and 16 with different events, including a concert by Stan Strickland and Josh Rosen, and a, a talk and um, open. The gallery will be open until December 24th. All proceeds of sales of these paintings are to community churches, um, very, very deferred maintenance. Um, uh, uh, and construction program. Um, that's all. And I, finally, I just put the link to Medea's um, uh, video on our Facebook page. So you can find it there. And I, I'm really sorry that this, this flat screen just didn't talk. I'd be glad to. Okay. Dean, 
Medea, can I say a word? Can you hear me? Dean, Medea. I was so caught up with uh, with tech uh, malfunction that um, I forgot that I was gonna. I was gonna start with a song, but thanks for asking, Cole. Just drugstore glasses, that's all right. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Do not beg for your salvation. From preachers, kings, and masters, the people hold the power. Arise and claim your freedom. The powerful and wealthy, they are only human beings. On earth we are all equal. Arise, arise, arise. Because in the end, freedom will be international while politicos divide us they demand their compensation they should pray we don't refuse them arise and claim your freedom while all of us were sleeping the bank owners got richer at the expense of all our children arise 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 they are frightened by our numbers and by our interdependence and rightfully they should be arise 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 because in the end freedom will be international numb yourself with purchases or vain overconsumption. Do not isolate your spirit. Arise and claim your freedom. Your TV and your iPhone seek to keep you in your slumber. Step out into the sunlight. Arise, 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 rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming, the land will soon be flooded, the past is dead and over, rise up and claim your freedom, you are the sleeping giant, arise, 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 because in the end, freedom will be, because in the International. Sung by Jim Infantino. Thank you all for being here and come back for a Sunday sometime. We've got a bunch of weeknight events coming up too. A, a program about Hebron, a program about Gaza, two, two Cuba programs in, in November into December. So check us out. Thank you again, Medea.